Well, good afternoon. Thanks to all of you for being here for the very first CCC OER webinar of the academic year. I know that this is a time of year when you're all very busy getting started with your students and other things that are going on with your institution. So we very much appreciate that you're taking the time out to be with us uh, for the next hour. So if you would like, uh, uh, please put in chat um, who you are, what your institution is, and where in the country or the world your institution is located so that we can get a chance to, to quickly get to know who is here today. So my name is Shinta Hernandez, and I am the Vice President of Professional Development on the CCC OER Executive Council. I work with a wonderful professional development team who help uh, come up with these webinar topics and other professional development opportunities that uh, come through uh, CCC OER. And then at my institution, Montgomery College, which is located in Maryland, right outside of Washington, DC, I am the founding dean of the virtual campus, and I also help to lead all of our OER efforts at my institution. So this webinar is called Bookstores in the World of Open. Um, before we get started, let me run the agenda uh, quickly with you. So I will provide a, an overview of what CCC OER is, what we do, what we stand for. Then we'll jump right into the, the good stuff, into the panel discussion where you'll get to hear about the Doers 3 survey. Um, Doers, for those of you who may not be familiar, stand for Driving OER, Sustainability for Student Success. And then you'll get a, a chance to hear from two institutions who have engaged with their bookstores. They're gonna talk about how they've engaged with their bookstores and these positive exchanges um, to provide students with what they need to be successful. And then after the panel, we'll share some upcoming events and offer you some ways to get information or to continue getting information from us or about us. So to share with you what CCC OER stands for, who we are, what we do, uh, first and foremost, we are out there to increase awareness of open educational resources that are high quality. We increase access to these high quality OERs for you. We also support faculty choice and faculty development, such as the, these webinars that um, we have lined up for you. We also foster OER leadership all around, um, all around the region, all around the country. And so we provide also uh, opportunities for us to grow in that space. And then really ultimately, we're here to improve student equity and student success. And in case you're wondering how, where are we? How big are we? So we've grown quite a bit since our last set of webinars back in um, spring of 2022. So we have 108 members across 36 states um, and always looking to expand. So this gives you an idea of, of where we are in the country or where we are in North America. And if you're interested, um, there is the URL link at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, if you wanna get a chance to know us a little bit more, um, and see what it takes to be a member of CCC OER. So now we get to dive into the panel itself. So let me give you a brief introduction of our wonderful panelists. Uh, so first we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna be able to hear from Kevin Corcoran. He is the Associate Vice President of Digital Learning for the Connecticut State Colleges and Universities System. Kevin is responsible for the development and support of system-wide strategies for the effective use of digital learning tools and content that focuses on quality standards and practices, as well as student engagement, accessibility, and affordability. Kevin also currently chairs both a CSCU system-wide and a Connecticut statewide Open Educational Resources Council and has served as the chair of the Doers 3 Collaborative. Next, we will hear from Colleen Sanders, She's the Open Educational Resources and Course Materials Affordability faculty at Lynn Benton Community College in Albany, Oregon, where she helps faculty adopt OER and innovative tech, uh, pedagogy. In her previous role as faculty librarian at Clackamas Community College in Oregon City, Oregon, Colleen spearheaded the library's OER advocacy amidst bookstore outsourcing to Barnes and Noble. Her work has been featured in publications and conferences informed OER advocacy in multiple states. She was awarded a 2019 Open Oregon Educational Resources OER Champion Award and will be the subject of a new Library Juice Academy offered in 2023. 
And then we will hear from Cindy DeMica, who is currently the manager of open and inclusive academics at Nicollet College in Wisconsin. The OER program at Nicollet College was launched in 2018 while she was the bookstore manager there. Since then, Cindy has grown the program since its inception, inception using knowledge from the bookstore and is now infusing a DEI lens on the program. She's involved with open education at the state level and beyond as a founding member of the Wisconsin Technical uh, College Systems OER Network and has served on the CCC OER Executive Council for the last three years. So with that, I welcome all three of our panelists to the stage and I will stop, share, and hand it over to Kevin. Fantastic, thank you, Shinta. And I'm very happy to kick this off, but I think everybody will be in agreement that we're really listening here for Colleen and Cindy's stories, and I'm just uh, sort of the table setter here. So if you can just verify you can see my slides. All right. So Shinta, thank you so much for introducing Doers, and I have been the, the past chair, but just in case folks are not familiar with the acronym in the organization, it is a collaborative of 30 plus higher ed systems or statewide or province-wide um, organizations uh, that represent about 800 institutions across North America. And really what the focus here is looking at OER sustainability related to student success. So uh, there's a collaborative effort and the bookstore report is one, you may have seen the tenure and promotion matrix float around at one point in time and there's an OER, uh, an equity rubric that's also been passing around. So those are all efforts that are coming out of the Doers 3 organization. But uh, today what we're gonna do is quickly talk about the 2020 study we did on OER fulfillment in campus stores. Uh, I wanna first recognize some folks that were part of this study. Michelle Reed, who was at University of Texas Arlington at the time, who's now I think inside the University of Illinois system. Uh, Deep Chinoy, who was part of the University of Maryland system uh, in consulting, and then Annika Many, who's also part of that same system, were core contributors to this study. And the purpose of this really was that there had been so many anecdotal stories about particular challenges or concerns related to OER fulfillment related to the bookstores. We really wanted to quantify those and contextualize those. Uh, understanding that the bookstore, the campus store plays a critical role for listing and fulfillment of any learning materials. So we really wanted to capture that. So when this survey went out, we had about 70 plus respondents that represented about 64 different institutions and systems. And it was a good diverse uh, representation, uh, representative body that res uh, responded to that. And I will provide these, these slides and there's a link to the full report. Uh, I'll also add that link after my session's done. But what our respondents really identified as major issues were really about uh, presenting or displaying OER consistently within the bookstore software. So whether it was that the book didn't necessarily have an ISBN number, it was something that didn't have a unique identifier or an alternate ID. And so it wasn't really uh, connected to that system that really looks at an ISBN number. You know, there may have been uh, confusion around what was required versus what was re recommended. There have been some stories where by default, a print version of an OER was set as required, even though there was a digital option. In some cases, there was a digital option that had a fulfillment fee uh, associated with that. There's also been some concerns about flexibility around language. Um, in many cases, it was that there wasn't a custom text field that would specify there maybe was canned responses that would be something like no textbooks required, which wasn't necessarily true or refer to the syllabus, which really doesn't give a, the student a real sense of what the required texts are for this. And, you know, another area of, of concern was getting access to the data that's being collected by the campus bookstore and the, the software and having granular access to how many units were sold and in what manner, um, whether that was rentals, uh, new print, new digital rental, what have you, and having access to that in a, in a regular consistent basis. So those were the, the, the areas that were the, the major challenges that were reported in, during the survey. Now, we also had some effective practices that were reported here. So we, we tended to see those, these uh, effective practices implemented at 
smaller bookstores, so either campus owned or independent bookstores. But we did see folks reporting back that there was uh, deno uh, denoted uh, OER within the catalog that there would be uh, uh, markings within the bookstore itself that not only was there a physical print, but there also was access to a digital online, um, that, that there was pricing that was clearly marked, and that there was regular intervals to access that data. So there was some best practices that were happening out there, but not to the scale of the challenges that were reported. So again, the purpose here really wasn't just to create a report and just air dirty laundry of what grievances were. The really, it was going back to quantifying this and contextualizing this to have a conversation, and we did. So members of Doers 3 reached out and had conversations with Barnes & Nobles, with Follett, with Campus Stores Canada, and with the National Association of College Stores, and I saw Rich online here. And we had a great dialogue. And so what we realized here was it wasn't a one-way street. It wasn't always one person's particular fault that there was a responsibility across the board. And what, in the report, what we tried to identify is those five areas really where there needed to be some improvement or at least some effort or concentration here. And I'm going to walk through these just a little bit quickly. So from an institutional standpoint, do you have clear policies and protocols about making OER reported to the bookstore? So are folks actually reporting OpenStax fulfillments to the bookstore, or are they just using that as a reference within the, uh, the syllabus? So uh, do the bookstores know that there is OER being used? Is there clear dates on when materials have to be reported to the bookstore, and is OER part of that communication trail? And so I'm not going to read through all of these, but you know, when we came back with some recommended best practices, there were some things that the institution could at least go back and review and see if they had these checks, uh, you know, marked off. Same thing goes for faculty. You know, is there a timely reporting of these going through? Is the right information being provided? If there isn't an ISBN, is there some alternate ID that can be produced, or is the URL directly to wherever that source material is? So, if that source material is in OEN, if it's in LibreText or some other place and it doesn't have an ISBN, can you at least provide the source reference point to that? And then another clear piece is really telling the bookstore, this is an optional, or I'm requiring the digital version, the print version is an optional uh, piece, or vice versa. I really require, because this is a workbook, that I'm requiring the print version versus the digital one here. So better communication between the bookstore and the faculty and the institution were some of the, the outcomes here. And then from the OER coordinator standpoint or the OER advocate is really encouraging, you know, this timely adoption piece of that broad communication, making sure that the institution and the faculty have these deadlines and these protocols and that they're adhering to those so that the bookstore can provide this information. And then helping identify any errors in the submissions. Um, there may be items that are being reported or underreported, or there may be markings or what have you that are in error. So just helping out with that whole process, or at least making sure that the department chairs, the course schedulers, or whoever is responsible for fulfillment is helping out here. And then really looking at where there's two, uh, two areas of focus here on the bookstore side. So understanding that there is software that the, the campus stores are using for fulfillment, which isn't necessarily owned by the bookstore. So they're using third-party software that may or may not have limitations on what it can do. So there's a challenge out or a request out to those campus store software or to the campuses, the campus stores when they're procuring their, their software to include better mechanisms to en enter OER into this system. Ideally, it, there would be a great verification process for those license and pricing. So if something's entered in error, that there is some checks and balances here. And again, I'm not going to read through all of these just because I really want to get to, to Cindy and Colleen here. But it really, it, it, it's the focus here is that there are some software enhancements that can happen to ease this whole process, not only from the bookstore management side, but also from the faculty and institutional side. But there are also some bookstore policies and protocols that could be improved. You know, better instructions around step-by-step -step guides for, for adoptions, 
and how you can denote OER adoptions within the bookstore. Even if these functionalities don't exist within the software platform, how can you provide workarounds that better, better educate or, or better denote to students the options that are available? And then especially in-store purchases, better signage, better markings, that there are digital options that are free besides the, what's ever on the shelf. I do want to note one piece, and you know, it, uh, this is just not to call out or endorse one particular product or vendor, but just to note that Barnes and Nobles, when we were having this uh, active conversation about how they can improve their OER listing and fulfillment, talked about a new platform, a new update that came out this past spring, where they were talking about the ability to upload materials into the adoption process. So if you have a PDF that you pulled from Merlot or from, o from OER Commons, there's an opportunity to embed that right in the platform. There was also this option to discover affordable solutions. Um, you know, whether or not that function works 100%, but they also do have a new piece where there is some custom messaging that can be done around OER adoptions and a guided walkthrough. So it seems that Barnes and Nobles was working on this and was reaffirming that they had heard similar feedback and in their exchange that they were working towards that. So I, I, again, not an endorsement, but just a recognition that Barnes and Nobles was working towards this. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that I've seen the OER listservs in some of the Spark conversation that has addressed some concerns with Barnes and Nobles fulfillment. And that while the software enhancements are fantastic, there's still operational challenges that we're facing. And so I, with that, I'm, I'm going to stop my presentation here and, and hand it over to my colleagues. Thanks for that, Kevin. I believe I'm up next. And one thing about that presentation and all that information that you just shared is, I just feel so much appreciation for our bookstore colleagues and how much work they do and how technical and difficult it is. So um, I want that to be really front and center before I get started. My other disclaimer is that the views I'm about to go into don't represent my employers. I'm talking from my experience personally. I'm Colleen. I'm bringing a faculty and specifically librarian perspective to this conversation. Um, my positionality is that I'm an advocate for students for healthy collaborative relationships with all the stakeholders in the course materials delivery um, situation to achieve what I consider a fiscally and ethically viable future. So sometimes that means pushing back against commercial textbook affordability, and sometimes that means embracing it um, when it's necessary. So my presentation will be my experience and my work. Um, I'll do a really high level overview of the issues that are on the table when you start to engage in this work that you'll want to pay attention to and deeper, do a deeper dive into. Um, and then I have takeaways and resources, and of course we have time for questions. So. With a lot to cover, I'll start with the elephant in the room. Do we have a problem? Um, you're probably here because you or people that you work with perceive a conflict perhaps between the bookstore and OER or textbook affordability. It may be rooted in the problem of profitability. This is um, where my experience draws from and it's a valid question. I believe that if we are working in the bookstore as retail paradigm, it's very difficult to get away from this, but it's my core belief. Um, that we are all partners and allies in this work of serving students and putting their success first. Um, I feel like the idea that, you know, bookstore and library or OER and textbook affordability should be pitted against each other is a logical fallacy, especially when your bookstore is independent. We're all employed by the college, we share a mission, we're here for our students. It does get murkier if your bookstore employees have been replaced by a third party vendor. In my case, I've worked at Barnes and Noble because those people are responsible and accountable to their company, which is profit driven. So um, there's pieces there that make this a more nuanced conversation. My experience is that bookstore managers and employees are hardworking, empathetic, student-centered people and some of my best allies in textbook affordability and OER efforts. Some are already affordability leaders, some want to be, but are really, really busy with the daily details of everything Kevin just unpacked for us, right? It's a lot. Um, those positions and that expertise is not going away no matter what we do in the future. Um, their jobs though, aren't necessarily always to pro provide a vision for the future because they are fulfilling the orders that come in from faculty. So faculty have a lot of power in deciding 
what this bookstore future model will be because what they assign is what the bookstore is built around. So I don't see this as a problem anymore. I see it as a large scale cooperation dilemma, which is borrowing language from Carmen Spaniola of Peak Oil. So in a large scale cooperation dilemma, we have a lot of players. So on this slide, I have the core players in my experience of doing OER and textbook affordability work with our bookstore, independent and outsourced. Um, everyone from admins, faculty, librarians, student bookstore folks, your board, your office, of accessibility and inclusion. There's a lot of people who are involved in this, right? And we all need to create spaces to have conversations about the core questions here. What is the purpose of a community college bookstore? What are student and faculty needs now? What are they gonna be in five years, right? Because once you start building in a direction, you're committed to that direction and small decisions, small incremental changes you make now are going to put you in a very different place five years, 10 years down the road. Um, a big question is, can publisher materials still meet our diversity, equity, and inclusion-based missions, our access missions, our accessibility needs, our flexibility needs for student formats? These are things everybody needs to have an opportunity to talk about, because it's like that metaphor of blind men um, touching the elephant of everyone sees a slightly different part of it, so it looks different for them. So people need an opportunity to collaborate and get together um, to see the complexity of this dilemma. Um, with a large scale cooperation dilemma, um, the big question as I see it is for those of us who are working in higher ed, we're entrusted with helping the students now and creating the conditions for students in the future to have systems that work for them for course materials access that are centered on our missions, right? This is all about mission while being economically viable, not how do we make a profit as a bookstore? How do we break even as a bookstore? How do we work with our bookstore even? Um, when we think about the bookstore's retail paradigm, those are the only questions allowed to us. So we need to invite in more nuance and complexity. We need new language, new models. That's why I say, instead of, oh, the bookstore, I say course materials access, right? Because of what we're using in our modern classrooms. Um, so I see three key skills or commitments um, to addressing this. The first is collaboration at best, cooperation at minimum. Again, we all occupy different parts of the institution, um, but if our core goal is mission, is students, um, we signed up for these positions, for these jobs to work together, and that's what we need to do. Um, we also need to understand that these issues are nuanced and complex and evolving. It's not gonna be a single solution answer that's neatly packaged, right? And everything's finished now, it's one, um, agenda on your meeting or one item on your meeting agenda. This is a long-term commitment to developing nuanced understandings of complex topics. Um, knowing that we're aiming for a future that looks very different from what we have right now, but that the apparatus that we have now, right, which comes from pre-internet, pre-open license, pre-open access, publisher-governed realities is what we're working with. So um, with an eye towards like these big aspirational futures, I'm going to roll it back and talk about where we're working now and what we're working with in my experience. Um, so I hope you can extrapolate from my little story what you can for your institution or your organization. So again, I am in Oregon State in the United States, and um, the majority of the work that I'm speaking about today is, was at Clackamas Community College, um, which decided to outsource bookstore operations to Barnes & Noble Education. There was one academic year in between that transpired between announcing that we're, we're going to outsource the bookstore and the new bookstore opening one academic year so this stuff moves fast and if you plan to be involved and to be an advocate and to be a supporter for students get ready learn these things in advance because it's just going to get quicker over time um we were the first oregon community college to outsource oregon has a really strong history of independent bookstores um and at our institutions, about 70 to 80% of sales are course materials, right? So t-shirts, calculators, the rest of it. We're really talking about what students need to be successful in courses with these numbers. Um, yeah, so the contract was designed to be replicated at other institutions because Barnes & Noble is creating efficiencies in order to spread. That is its uh, business model, right? So the elephant in the room, I don't think is conflict. It's a conflict of missions and purposes, right? So I'm gonna cover three main issues. And the first is exactly that, having differing missions from a community college to a for-profit bookstore. So you'll notice here, I'm not necessarily talking about independent bookstores, although there's a lot of overlap in both directions. So again, extrapolate what you can from this. So at Clackamas Community College versus Barnes and Noble Education, 
community college is publicly funded, not there to make a profit. Barnes and Noble is. Um, they're publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. At our institution, we find success through equity, through finding variegated solutions to level the playing field for folks in different um, positions with different advantages and disadvantages, through inclusivity, through having multiple ways of doing things. Barnes & Noble's business model finds success through exclusivity, through single access codes for homework platforms, right? Through killing off the secondhand market. That is just the facts. There's a tension there. Um, at our institution, we're accountable to our community and to our board, period. Barnes & Noble is accountable to shareholders for making money. At our institution, we perceive students as whole people learners. At Barnes & Noble, they are a market. That's what they are. And if you go to their website, they advertise to their partners like Chevrolet and Visa. We get work with us. We get you access to 400 million students and all their purchasing power. It's a different conception um, based on their mission, right? Um, and they also do collect and use student data. So in some senses, we're offering our students as a product. I'm not trying to make this laden with value judgments. I feel like I'm stating facts. And I'm also going to do in my next slide a really high over level overview of um, when you enter into this work, especially with contract negotiations, you're going to want to read the contracts. You're going to find a lot of surprises that aren't just course materials delivery. High level view. Um, there were exclusivity clauses about using OER. Couldn't use any OER that wasn't provided by Barnes & Noble until we reversed that in negotiations. They prohibited information sharing about textbook affordability options with students. A campus in Florida actually received a takedown notice about a guide about how to find affordable textbooks from Barnes & Noble, and they had to take it down. Um, integrating with college systems, how will you preserve student data privacy? They have deals with specific publishers, which sure might get you a better price, but does it expand academic freedom? Um, they advertise credit cards at the cashier tier uh, tills and on the website, which if students aren't informed about financial literacy and making smart decisions can lead them into a bad place. Might not have perpetual access to eBooks. Is there tech support or does that follow the library or your e-learning center? There will be exclusivity for course packs and publisher clearings. Um, they have content specialists that weigh in on course design, so that, that comes as part of your bookstore package as well. You will lose employees to your third-party vendor. They have a Bartleby homework help site in the realm of Chegg homework help websites that they will promote, or they did promote. I guess I shouldn't be saying well, they did promote um, on the student user interface for textbook ordering. We didn't have a mechanism to enforce all the awesome language that we got into our contract to protect students. So on the ground, there was some struggle there. And um, yeah, Barnes & Noble uses college branding. They, they hide their presence as a for-profit corporation. So look out for that. Those are all pieces that we worked through and worked with our bookstore, our administration and Barnes & Noble and one another, but this all happened. Another big piece is you okay so i'm a librarian i'm a faculty member i know a lot about textbook affordability both what i consider textbook affordability writ large and also commercial textbook affordability programs which are different entities um so for those of you who are here today who know about inclusive access single access user codes what's happening to the secondhand market um oer based products as opposed to oer this is your cue to step up and share that information and advocate for your students and educate on your campuses. Um, and if you're in a leadership position or you don't know what those words I just said mean, um, to be curious and willing to learn about those things. Um, they will, a third party vendor has purchasing power. They have publisher partnerships. They offer inclusive access programs, which that's the tip of the iceberg. And they sell OER based products. So an OER put behind a paywall on a proprietary learning management system. On Kevin's slide, there was that ability to check, I'm using OER. When our faculty did that, they were put on a marketing list and Barnes & Noble would email them and say, oh, we see you're using OER. Do you wanna use our OER-based LMS? And so what used to be a free course could then be converted to a $39 OER-based course. So do administrators know that these pieces, if you invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in your OER initiatives only to have them potentially undone, um, if you don't know what you're getting into or how to speak this language. The quote of not all OER materials are free was in our contract supplied by Barnes & Noble. So we had some advocacy and educating upward to do. 
a lack of understanding of OER, and I'd add to that, textbook affordability and inclusive access at your leadership level will leave you vulnerable to vendor promises of convenience and access to OER materials, right? This is all coming downstream to us from publishers. So is that an appropriate choice in this day and age for your institution? Just be ready to think about that and talk about that. And finally, I'm wrapping up. I know I'm going long. Um, data. This was mentioned also in Kevin's. Um, when you outsource, you no longer own your data. You can try to advocate for it in the contract, but that data is a major financial asset that that company wants um, because they use it to market and they use it for other reasons. So you need to think about how you'll protect student privacy, how you will retain access to your textbook and OER adoption data in order to use it, right? And to get it in a way that's not a big, 50 page unusable PDF or messy spreadsheet, right? Because that's a lot of labor. In my state, um, in Oregon, we have to report, there's a, a house bill, we have to report our adoptions to the state. And if we can't get that information, we're out of compliance, like OER initiatives aside. Um, and you also need to think about your LMS, which is an online classroom and what surveillance or tracking or marketing might be done there. Big takeaways, bookstore outsourcing is absolutely an equity issue start to finish. So make sure to keep those coupled. It's not just financial. Um, including students early and often is very important. One of my colleagues, Maggie Wright at Lane did beautiful work involving students when they were tapped to outsource. Um, and that's documented online, you can find it. And follow your values, ask questions, name open washing when you see it. If you even know that word, you're already 10 steps ahead of the game um, and find your allies. Other takeaways, look for new models. It's not there yet, but we need to baby step our way there using what we have and who we have to get to a place that's sustainable for the future. It's a long haul. You'll be doing a lot of educating, but at the core for me, it's compassion for my people. Like this work is accomplished through people, by people, for people, and all parties might believe that their method is the best. Um, and it's a matter of negotiating that complexity. I am finished. I think I went long. I apologize, Cindy. I cannot wait to hear from you. No, thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Kevin, for both of your presentations. I, trust me, I appreciate them. And let me bring this up. So I'm here today to speak to you um, from my bookstore manager um, experience. So these two photos are <laughs> representative of what I used to see from my students um, when they would come into the bookstore. And um, it didn't matter if they were paying $50 or $600 for their textbooks. These were the expressions that I got. I had students that would leave in tears. I would have students that would be mad. I would have, it, it, it trust me, it, they haunt, these expressions haunt you forever. Um, and there's not a lot you can do about it. So the historical context was um, several years ago, we had a new president start and his words to me in one of the first meetings that I was in with him was to start researching OER. Um, so as a bookstore manager, my first thought was, are you kidding me? We're going to give books away for free. I had never, at that time, I had never heard of OER. Um, so I started researching it and I'm like, this is amazing. I can get rid of our, our, our student expressions like this. I can actually have them go away happy. Um, and it grew from there. And so, um, as Shinta mentioned, the bookstore program started with me as a bookstore manager um, out of the bookstore. So what I want to talk about is um, that college bookstores are a treasure trove of information. And what can you learn from your college bookstore? So as I researched um, OER and found out more about it, I found that I could actually influence the OER usage on our campus. Um, so our faculty were used to being pitched books from publisher salespeople. I mean, that was just common. Um, so I turned into a salesperson. And I started when I started, I started with easy books like OpenStax and whatnot, and I started pitching them to our faculty. And oh my gosh, they bit. Um, and I found that. I knew when new editions were coming out, 
this is a perfect time to pitch a book to a faculty member. They're going to have to change things anyways. Why not change to a free book for students? And that started to work. Um, then publishers started to go to this rental only model. And that's actually a problem for students. I mean, some students don't have credit cards. Some students want to keep their books. This is problematic for our students. This is a perfect time to pitch an OER book if I can find one. And then publishers started to go to ebook only and digital access codes only. This is a problem for some of our students. And this is time to pitch OER to our faculty and faculty bit. And then, of course, there's the high cost books, which we all have those. Let's see if I can find an OER to, to do that. It works. So I became a salesperson on campus. I became the most popular salesperson on campus as I started to pitch all these OER books. So your bookstore is going to be the perfect place to find all of these things. What new editions are coming out? What books are rental only? What books are ebook only? I mean, in these things, the rental books, the ebooks, that's that's the biggest thing now with publishers is switching to those. And of course, the high cost, you can get cost from the bookstore. The other thing that the, one of the big things about talking to your bookstore manager or bookstore employees are what are students saying about textbook usage? So even if you're just listening to your students as they come in, what are students saying at buyback? And I know buyback has been fairly slim over the last couple of years because at, from COVID, but are they bringing back textbooks that are unopened? And okay, granted, you may have a few that just never opened them, but when you see five or six coming back with the shrink wrap still on them, okay, that's something to investigate. Are the faculty, so this actually happened, five or six would come back from the same class, I went to the faculty member and the faculty member said, well, I thought I had to assign a textbook. They were never using it. They just, they were under the assumption that they had to assign a textbook. So students were spending $120 on a textbook every term because they were under the impression they had to assign a textbook. Well, guess what? Next semester, they had no textbook. They were using various things from the internet. But these are the things that you can learn from your bookstore. What's happening at buyback? What's happening? Are students not coming in until two, three weeks into the semester because they've heard that they don't have to buy a textbook? Um, what, are, what are the students saying? I mean, bookstore employees or bookstore managers, if they're listening to their students or listening to this, this scatter that comes in, um, they know these things. Um, one of the things that a lot of, lot of colleges are moving to are wanting to, um, and I know Kevin had kind of talked about this a little bit, is putting, you know, indicators on course schedules and bookstores, they know all of this. They know all of the courses, hopefully, that have low cost or no cost, or you can get listings from the bookstore. Um, I should also indicate we are a college-owned bookstore. I should have started with that. Um, so unlike um, the third party, we are more than happy to, to do all of this. Um, we submit our low cost, no cost to the course schedule. And so students know upfront what classes they are signing up for and anecdotal evidence from our advisors. Students are going to the no cost sections first and students are actually coming in and asking for those um, when they're signing up for courses. Um, bookstores can help you calculate the cost savings um, when you're trying to figure out the return on investment for some of these OER programs. Um, one thing we, we live, um, our college is in a very rural area. Internet can be an issue. And then also some students still prefer print books. So the bookstore um, does do print on request for all of our books. Some, I know some colleges do um, have print books automatically. We try to do a print on request service because books, our faculty like to adapt books and they will go through every semester and make changes or updates um, to those books. We don't like to have a lot on hand. So we do do a print on request and it is um, a exactly the cost of what it costs us to print and bind it um, for our students. And then also, I know this is talked about um, on Kevin's uh, presentation as well. The bookstore um, controls how OER is reflected on the bookstore website. So partnering with them to talk about 
verbiage and the required versus optional and how that is presented is extremely important so that students are aware up front um, and they're not purchasing unneeded materials. Um, so those are some of the, the ways that we've we've partnered with the bookstore to do some of these things. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Anything that um, you can think of with the bookstore, you should be able to partner with them. Our college doesn't see it, the loss in sales as a bad thing. Um, it actually, we've um, kind of framed it as our students are more successful and they're actually completing courses. And when they complete courses, they complete programs. Um, and with enrollment across the country being down, this is a good thing to have our students keep coming back. And then also anecdotally, I don't have numbers to back this up, but when we have um, students who have mainly OER books, they may, they're may they coming in to buy their one or two low cost books from the bookstore instead of going out and two third parties um, like Amazon or someplace like that. Um, they find it just easier to come in and, and buy the, the few books that they need, if any, from us. So, um, that is all I have for mine. I will stop sharing. Well, this is all such wonderful information. Thank you so much, Kevin and Colleen and Cindy for uh, the, the different things that you, the three of you have provided in this, in this context, in this space. I just wanna do a, a quick uh, snapshot of my own takeaways and then I will address some of the questions that are on chat. And if any of you have questions, please feel free to, to raise your hand, you can use the um, reactions icon at the bottom of your screen, or you can also type the question in chat. But a couple of takeaways that I had, um, Kevin, I appreciated that list of, and I'm sure others in the audience appreciated the list of recommended practices that you separated by institutions, by faculty. You also uh, talked about OER coordinators. You also talked about software implications, policy implications, and very useful information. Colleen, I like the new terminology that you've shared with us, the large-scale cooperation dilemma. <laughs> That's a really a really good spin to it, a really neat way to, to, to talk about this, to categorize this. Um, and then Cindy, the, the strategies that you presented uh, in, as you dealt with your bookstore as the bookstore manager, and then also the college-owned bookstore, also the emphasis, the angle that you talked about, that student success, college completion angle, that I think allows people to recognize that the bookstore model has to evolve in order to meet those, those um, student success metrics. So I appreciate all three of you. Uh, there were a couple of questions in chat. Um, one question has already been addressed and that was uh, to get a link to the Doers 3 report. And so that was from Michelle and Una had present or put the link in to that report. So you, you certainly have it in the chat. And then Rachel asked a question and this really could be for any of the panelists. What methods do you have to educate faculty? Because so many of them are not necessarily aware of the specific challenges that bookstores face. I can start with, with mine. Um, so as methods, publisher methods changed over the years from print to rental only to digital, um, I would meet or talk to the faculty involved and explain the implementations to the students on these changes so that they understood um, what it meant and what what was going to happen to the students. Um, for example, with the rental books, um, rental only books, I would explain, okay, it requires a credit card. Not all of our students have credit cards um, and how how the effects were going to, all these things happen. And then with the, now with the, all the eBooks, the eBook only is how not all of our students have internet or reliable internet. Um, and I would explain to them, you know, the ramifications to our students. And I'll admit, it, it's not always successful. I'm not always successful. But if I can even get some of them to, to think, you know, about the students and, and, and switch to something else, then I'm happy. Um, I'd be happier if all of them did that. Um, but it does take a lot of educating on all of the, and you try to put the student at the center of it and how it's going to affect the student. Terrific. Um, I know, Kevin, you had unmuted if you wanted to. Yep, say I'll, I'll jump in, but I guess, Colleen, if you wanted to go next. Um, you know, I, I was going to say it's sort of, for, for at least for me, it's a sort of a Swiss Army knife approach. 
it's really depending it's really dependent on who the audience is. Um, quite often, it's a conversation that starts with, "What are the barriers you're facing now? Is it that your students aren't reading the material? Okay, is that because the cost barrier? Is it because they're uninterested in the information? Is it not reflective?" So, you know, depending on your institutional goals too, if you have, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion goals, how is the commercial material meeting that? Or better, how is an open license going to support those efforts? If there's focus around universal design for learning as an avenue, you can talk about how the open license and the open content meet those goals. Uh, and then, it, you know, for the faculty that are price conscious, talking about those barriers about the, the textbook market, but I, I think having different stories, different anecdotes, different approaches, depending on the different faculty needs is probably the, uh, a good way to go if you can. Yeah, I appreciate the Swiss Army knife um, metaphor because that's mine too. After you asked, I just jotted down a list of what I've done. So like, from a high level, I think about faculty lives, their work lives, and I think of the intersection points where I can catch them, times and places where they're congregated or grouped together. So that might be faculty senate, association meetings, division meetings, professional development. And I try to show up at those spaces as much as I can, or um, you know, being only one person or having a small team, um, finding my faculty champions and allies, classroom faculty who can raise those issues in those spaces with faculty, listen to one another um, in a way that's different than how they listen to me as a faculty development person or a librarian, right? Um, at my second institution after I left Clackamas, it was another um, community college, but up in Washington State, um, I got involved with the association because there are issues of academic freedom copyright clearance, There's there are um, issues that overlap with collective bargaining within this work. Um, so getting them involved is really powerful. Again, going to um, Board of Education and meetings with deans, all campus emails, sure. Yeah, I try to do anything but that, but I do those too because you wanna make sure you're giving um, your adjuncts or part-time faculty a chance to engage. I always have a static web presence of information for this, whether it's a library guide or a website on, um, the Center for Teaching and Learning page where it's like, okay, where's that one thing I can look at to learn more when I have time? I get a lot of traction in one-on-ones, like Kevin was saying, oh, you're experiencing a pain point in your class. Why is that student, you know, what's the complaint? Oh, they don't do the readings. Why not? Oh, the homework suffers. Oh, they're not getting it. So much of this is students don't actually have their course material and they and you don't know that that's the cause of these issues. I've also worked with our institutional research departments to use um, student completion data or attrition data to say, okay, where are we losing folks? And then you can maybe map that to your degree program and be like, oh yeah, that's the course that uses $150 textbook, go to that faculty. So we also had, um, we added questions to the course evaluation surveys about textbook Book materials and whether students actually access them. So getting student responses in a way where those students can remain anonymous. It's a goal of mine to work more with student life and leadership to get those perspectives as well, because everybody will listen to them. It's just, I don't want to burden them with this work without compensating them. So it's like a trade-off. Some get really excited about it, like in student government, oh, I can advocate for cheaper textbooks um, and they make great partners. But again, being conscientious of our students' bandwidth. That's great. I appreciate all three of your responses. And I wanted to follow up with something that Colleen had said, and I'll come back to, to what's in chat and I'll look for raised hands. Um, Colleen, you had mentioned in one of your slides that uh, get, get, get the students engaged. And I'm, I remember the image that you had put out there. So this is really a, a question for all three of you, whoever wants to answer. And what specific strategies can we employ to get our students engaged that um, we believe might be successful? I'm happy to go first. I mean, I'll recognize the challenge that we have, at least within our community college system, is that the majority, if not all of our students are commuters. Um, many of them are working full time, at least at least part time. So it's really difficult to organize and have the students come together. But at the same time, having those student government associations educated and, and aware of the situation is a great way having students sit on your local OER council so they're aware of the, of what's, what's happening, um, inviting students 
into uh, your regional or your local OER events so their voice can be heard. Those are just some of the ways we've done it in Connecticut and the Northeast. I appreciate that, Kevin, thank you. And there is a question in the chat that I will um, just ask aloud in case uh, there are some of you who may not be able to see it because you might be on the phone. Um, so this question, uh, it's a, it's a, so it starts with, often these discussions, including today, is how to use the work, resources, and knowledge at the bookstore. Obviously this has a cost. Can you address the need for the institution to not only recognize loss of sales, but cost sharing? to help the bookstore to be able to afford providing all of these services and support. And specifically, Cindy, can you address having worn both of these hats, of the bookstore generally being self-op and the library funded by tuition and fees? Cindy, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I guess I, one, I was extremely lucky. I am extremely lucky at my institution um, that our shared goal at the entire institution is for the student to be successful. And I understand that the previous model of the bookstore was to be self-sufficient and self-funding. Um, but we were losing sales anyways. We were losing sales um, to Amazon, to wherever. And that doesn't change our goal in making the making sure our students are successful and so if we need if we need to change how we are doing that then we need to change how we are doing that to ensure the student's success um, and if that is through oer that is through oer and to try to fight to keep the sales and me and hurting the students then i think we're failing as an institution um, so I am I'm extremely grateful that our institution has chosen not to to go that route. Um, I think that that's about all I'm gonna. Thank you, Cindy, for addressing that question from Rich. Uh, we do have a hand raised, so let me get to this to this question. And and in the interest of time, this will be the last question. But I appreciate the activity that is happening in both the chat as well as vocally. So. Um, I see Kevin Shack, go ahead and, and ask your question. So it wasn't a question, but it's to elaborate what we do in response mm -hmm. to Rich's question. So Amy Maloney, who is our reference librarian who oversees OER and working with our faculty to develop OER, she and I are literally joint at the hip to increase OER and to increase student success. But in the in going back to Rich's question, it forced us as a bookstore, and I put it in the chat, to re-examine ourselves. So just like Cindy said that sales were already going down pre-COVID as we were entering this whole increase of OER because of everything from bootleg sharing, everything. So, but it gave us an opportunity to re-examine ourselves of where, where are we lacking in the bookstore? So we added, like I spent the chat, we added the coffee shop 10 years ago. We added the print shop six years ago. So that allowed us to control the cost of printing, doing the print on demand, but it also gave us opportunity to see other things like increased food sales in, in the bookstore. You know, change our merchandise mix. What are we doing wrong in non-textbooks? And certainly all of the other non-textbook items carry a larger margin than textbooks. So students are more apt to come in and buy eight sweatshirts two or three times a semester or pens or whatever, as opposed to buying that one textbook and you're gonna make more money and bigger, better profit and, and increase sales as opposed to just selling textbooks. And that's how we, we did it. We're still struggling because of COVID, but it's, it, you know, we're, we're getting on the right track. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you, Kevin, for sharing that. And thanks to, to all of you who are contributing in the chat as well. I apologize that I haven't had a chance to go one by one, but it is there for all of you to, to take a look at and to consider. I want to take the time now to thank Kevin, Colleen, and Cindy for an amazing panel, such scintillating conversations around partnerships and collaborations with the bookstore and your institution. I think um, I'm hopeful that many of us will walk away with some strategies that we can implement really right away, especially when engaging with our students, educating our faculty. I see those as opportunities that, can, that we can get started on right away. So now I'd like to spend the last five minutes um, wrapping up by sharing with you some additional 
opportunities that you can um, be a part of. So as I mentioned at the very beginning of the webinar, we have more webinars uh, uh, as part of our lineup here for the fall 2022 semester. So here are the dates and the titles, and you can certainly register by going to that URL, get more information about it. It is um, always the second Wednesday of each month, and it is typically 12 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. So please um, share this with your colleagues far and wide so that they can also be a part of this conversation and all of these um, related topics. And then to allow us all to stay in the loop with one another and to get the latest information, you can go to our website, cccoer.org, and where it says get involved, you can take a look at some of the upcoming conferences, get some more information about that. And you can also join our community email. You'll get a plethora of information from us um, on all the things that are happening. And then take a look at our EDI blog posts and our student OER impact stories. I can almost guarantee you that you'll walk away from, from reading those posts or stories with um, greater enthusiasm to advance this work and sustain this work at your institution. And if you can, please uh, take this short survey. We wanna know uh, how we did, how, how was it, and uh, what you thought of today's webinar. So we will put this in the chat um, so that you can access the, the form. And if you can take do that before you head out, log off, that would be terrific for us. So let me see if, if someone could place that link in the, la in the chat for me. Uh, I would appreciate it. So either Liz or Una, I thank you so much for putting the, the link in the, the survey link into the chat. And then, and then just so that you have our information as well, if you have any questions, if you want to brainstorm, you have some ideas for us, here are three important emails that you should just um, keep handy. Uh, note that all of these, the slides and the recording will be posted on the CCC OER website in about a day or two. So um, please stay tuned. So if you can fill out the survey, we would appreciate it. Thank you again so much for being here. And thank you, Kevin, Colleen, and Cindy for an amazing panel.